doesn't seem to match really quite well. So we wanted to kind of break this down a little bit more um, nationwide on why we might have faster speeds. I think there's a lot of reasons for it, but one of the ones that we could map was our unique demographics. Utah, as you probably know, has is the youngest state probably in the nation, and about half of people in Utah are under age 34, which that's huge. That blew my mind. So this map is broken up between 5 to 19, and the next one is 19 to 34, I think. Yeah. But this one's just kind of shocking. So that's, we think, one of the reasons why Utah has such fast speeds is that young population um, well demand for fast internet in Utah. And also, we have a very high high school education rate, so that's this one. So usually, um, people who have graduated high school and are younger, there's, that's the biggest population in the area. You know, lots of Netflix, also going to school, doing lots of things. Um, and this one's four-year college, which Utah isn't as high, but um, this, it drops out, I think it looks at people under age 25, with a, or it was an age cutoff, so we're thinking that people in Utah tend to graduate a little later. So. These are fun maps. They, and they, I think it's the blog post that Noah and I have to do for both of them are, both of them are pretty good this month. I'm pretty excited about both. So. Yeah, there was definitely one. And if you look at this map, the other states that are doing well, these all have a lot higher population density than we do. Um, even I think Washington is probably, I think a lot of it's probably here from North Dakota, so. Yeah, it's not an average, it's the percentage of households. So, so it's going to be skewed though, you know, if, you know, 0% of rural people have, you know, it, it's still going to, you know, if they're only 5% of the population, 95% is going to have that, you know. So that is important to keep in mind for that. And I actually just wanted to know what you did to kind of push up their internet from the from the school system and along plant and state. And Kelly, can you speak uh, up? Yes. <laughs> Is that better? Sorry. Okay. Um, I'm just going to have um, Rick Raleigh with the Immigration Town Council just talk a little bit about they they have sort of a proposed um, road um, project that will add a bike lane to that canyon that um, could be an opportunity for providers to put in infrastructure. So it's a really important issue that we've been following closely because that, that canyon has some, some um, issues with services. And so we just kind of want to see where the process is. And we'll, we'll invite you back, too, as, as things roll out. But if you want to hold the microphone, just give us, you can just give us a couple minute update very quick. Sure. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Um, it started off as just a bicycle safety issue. I, I, actually, it started off as legislation. Uh, I was trying to get single file legislation, and that was going nowhere. Um, so the Salt Lake County Council gave me some money to do a, a, a research project to, for bicycle safety to see if we could add a lane in the in the canyon. And it just turned into when we opened that box, it turned into many many more issues. Um, so now we've gotten to the point where we're looking for two more uh, telecom providers to uh, co-locate on the Verizon site there. Um, and I've talked to Tara about this actually uh, to get AT&T in there. We had an incident where we had a bicyclist uh, go down with a, a critical injury and neither of the paramedics could get out on AT&T or Sprint on the, the contracted phone for Salt Lake County. Um, so we were looking for those two service, services to come into the canyon, and also we don't have repeaters in the canyon, so we can't use business radios uh, in the canyon either. Those are a couple of things we're looking for. And I uh, talked to the township executive, uh, Patrick Leary, and we met with uh, Lynn Yoakum up here actually with UDOT, and uh, she suggested that we put uh, uh, 
the empty conduit into the road. So we're looking at that very seriously now. And the township executive, Patrick Leary, was talking about taking the, the, the uh, conduit all the way down to Foothill so the dunk can wash down, uh, down there so we can uh, sort of run that all the way up the canyon. And we have a real need in the canyon for better telecommunications. We have quite a few CEOs that, you know, actually live at, I mean, live in the canyon and they run their businesses worldwide a lot of time trying to use the internet. And if they go down, they end up going down to the Starbucks at Foothill or something to run their worldwide business. And it's, it's a really tough situation. We have a judge in town right now, and I've been talking to CenturyLink about it. He doesn't have phone and he doesn't have internet, either one of the two. He's a retired judge out of, of Newport Beach, California. Um, so it's it's a rough situation. We've got quite a few people up there that are wanting to, you know, have access to internet and better telecom, but it's just not available. So this is our opportunity to get that empty conduit into the road. We're going to make that commitment. Uh, Lochner Engineering is doing the engineering right now. If you wanted to make contact with them, they can give you specific detail on where we're at in the process. We're coming up on you know, some of the final phases of uh, of the safety issues that we've been looking at in the canyon. Um, and uh, we're getting to that point. In fact, Kelly, I think, is going to attend the next meeting. Um, we'll, we'll be making final recommendations to Salt Lake County, and then they'll be funding us. We have a couple million dollars in there right now to do it, but we should be at, be at rough, probably about the $10 million mark by the time we get to the bottom of the top of the canyon. Um, and we need to get into the, into the road, uh, get all of that infrastructure into the road, uh, and then and mill it, and then you know put a nice overlay on the road uh, for the bike trail. That's kind of what the goal is, because it's the it's really the um, the crown jewel of bicycling in, in Utah. It's been recognized, and so we're just trying to make it that way. So, any help Could you repeat you? which canyon? Em em Emigration Canyon. Emigration. Thank you. Certainly. Yeah, and one one unique thing about this, um, and is that that canyon is actually a county road. If it were a UDOT maintained road, um, it would, they already have kind of a process in place, but this is one of the first times that Salt Lake County has kind of gone through um, this process, and so, so they're new at this, and so let's support them as much as we can to help them through the process, um, and UDOT has been kind of helping with that, um, but that's kind of why it, um, it ha it's not automatically kind of in UDOT's radar, but they're, they're kind of um, helping out with with the process. They've been so, great too. Actually. Yeah, so we want to just stay involved and make sure the providers know at the right point that they can um, that they can come and talk to you. But but definitely we'd encourage if you're interested in that area to maintain the re relationship with Rick so that you can get um, on that schedule. So great. That's great because I'm hoping that the uh, UDOT is also coordinating with the Forest Service if it's cr crossing through Forest Service land. Yeah, it would be the county and, and part of the permitting process to do everything they'd have to, yeah. Great. And you, can, you can look up uh, Emigration Canyon website. Um, I think you can Google that. And uh, have the uh, Emigration Canyon Community Council contacts, and I'm on the, the top contact list and get a hold of me. Is or to Kelly. Is this a project that's going forward? It is. We're almost at the end of the engineering findings right now for a commission to the Salt Lake County Council, and we'll get it funded. and. We have a couple of million dollars in it right now. A lot of that's going to go to engineering and those issues. But the physical stuff is going to probably take a farm to get it done. So keep that in mind with your plans that there, there is very likely going to be an opportunity to put infrastructure in that road if they, if they work out. So. Okay. Especially in high cost areas like immigration canyons, need to be involved as an engineering planner and design an immigration canyon many years ago. And, and we, we have this issue in a lot of canyons. And one of the things is how are we going to get wireless service where it's not economical? And we are trying to work out possible legislative changes that might open up the door, at least for universal service funds, to help fund some top high cost areas where there's a significant public safety issue, such as what you 
certain kind that you might want to look at also is known with microduct, so there are multiple providers that use that conduit. Yep, we've actually included all of this into our, our master safety plan with the UFA as well. On these communications we're trying to reach out, we've reversed 911 and we've tried Twitter and all kinds of things to, to determine we just have to improve the infrastructure so we can be effective in that area. Hey Rick, I, I was wondering, have you been involved with the Salt Lake County meetings that Meredith has been yeah. holding? Okay. I just wanted to let you know I was there along with George Ames and CenturyLink and a bunch of other folks and and so we were working on it and the county is very interested in, in coordinating this. And I've been talking to George Ames, mm -hmm. Glennon Jensen, I've been talking to uh, uh, Larry Walter too, some of the shore meetings that have gone on. I really appreciate the, the time and promotion that they're doing. And, the, and yeah, to your efforts, I'm sure the county has been doing a really great job of getting people at the table. Yeah, I just kind of sit on their shoulders and pull them by the ears and try to get this mm -hmm. thing done. You know, but there's so much interest in it right now. And like I said, it's deserved to look at them, and so they're kind yeah. of just starting to do it. So, and we appreciate the people that they're coming and sharing with them. Okay, great. Um, so let's go on. Um, so Gordon Coles with the Utah Communications Authority just wanted to give a quick FirstNet update on what the the local first net team, um, where they're at right now, and then we'll move on to Dan Rickard. Um, slides, but I'll just give you a quick update. Everybody in here understands what first net is, right? Okay. A lot of meetings I go to, they're their first two. <laughs> they don't understand what it is. So, so right now, where we're at with first net is they've you know completed a bunch of the RFIs. They've gone through 12 or 13 RFIs, and they've got uh, a data collection process that they have us going through right now. So right now we're working on contacting all public safety entities within Utah to collect this data. And what they're looking for is, uh, let me flip right here so I don't have to go on these slides here. They're uh, asking uh, each entity to provide coverage identity. So they want to know what their coverage is today and then maybe what their future coverage needs might be. They're asking them to provide, uh, identify their users and the operational areas that they're in. They want to know what um, what their capacities are, uh, what uh, future capacity needs they might have. Um, they want to know who their service providers are, uh, how they're procuring that service. There's just a, a bunch of data that they want to collect. So right now we're working on reaching out to all the public safety entities in Utah. We've, we've got out to uh, all of the police chiefs, the fire chiefs, and the sheriffs so far. And we've got about a 40% response rate right now back from them in collecting some of this data. So we're working on that. We have uh, until September 30th to get this data all collected from about 650 public safety entities in Utah. Um, I think it's all collected, or submitted to FirstNet. FirstNet's going to take that data and use it in their RFP process to go out to the vendors to uh, just like with Coles is on building out this network, uh, building out the core network, and then also building the radio access network that each state's got to uh, have so that it can access the system as a whole. Um, We've been working with AGRC. Uh, they've, they've created an interactive map. It's, it's a, they've used the data from FirstNet's baseline coverage mapping that they've developed, and that's all came from 911 calls for the last year and a half. And this map is uh, it's an interactive map. Where you're, you're actually going to go in. You can go in as an agency and, and look at that map and say, see what they're what they're representing the coverage is and where you operate. And you can actually go in and change it. So if your coverage isn't what it says it is, or or uh, you, can, you can tell them what, what, you, what your coverage is. You can indicate that. Or you can go in and say, I, I need coverage here, or I don't have coverage. So you can mark up the map and send that back so that we can see, uh, provide that information to personnel on, on where our coverage needs to be. And that's information they're going to use in, in this RFP process. And that's where we're at right now. So while I was getting uh, the slides up, I'm Glenn Reichert, and uh, I'm the uh, founder and chief technology officer for US Ignite. And some of you have seen me talking to you folks before, but this is a very exciting time at US Ignite because a lot of the things I've talked to you about are about to become much more real. 
and um, some of our um, the National Science Foundation, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology are backing efforts to go and create what you might characterize as the next generation of the internet. What will the next generation of the internet look like? Well, first of all, let me reassure you that you're going to provide it. We're not a provider. We're not going to go and actually do anything. I don't need to attach to any of your polls, thank goodness. The other folks will to do these things, but uh, we're looking at wired and wireless schemes that basically do three things. The first is we think that the growth in data continues. And so we're going to need to be able to handle big data applications, more Internet of Things, Internet of Things that's going to be able to have many more devices that are communicating. So we think that the bandwidth is going to go up significantly. Second, and we think just as important, is that there's a whole class of applications that can't really happen now because there's too much latency on today's Internet. It just takes too many milliseconds to get from here to there. Now, if you're opening a web page and you're willing to wait a couple seconds for that web page to open, no big deal. But if you need to be able to have a remote medical monitoring arrangement where you need to know within a fraction of a second what that blood glucose level was so that you can operate that remote administration of insulin, that requires much faster response times and much more reliable response times. We can't have sometimes if the page takes 10 seconds to load. That just can't happen if you've got a medical device at the other end. There's lots of other applications like that. So big bandwidth, guaranteed fast response times. And this is probably the much tougher one. I think everyone in the room is working on how to get bigger bandwidth. But how to get the faster response times is a real challenge, but I think there's some good answers on doing that. And then I'm going to suggest some actions that everyone in this room can take to maybe help us within this area get some faster response times. And then the third one is that I think that we've come to the place where we would like to be able to, I'll use the word slice, the internet and have separable communications that run over a common physical infrastructure. So take the case of FirstNet. FirstNet would like to have great access everywhere. If it builds a new physical infrastructure, it's only going to be able to afford to get to certain places at certain bandwidths and speeds because that's what the new money will do in a complete overhaul. But what if we had everyone around this table be able to dynamically give FirstNet a piece of what they have in case of an emergency? And that would become part of the regulatory structure. Well, you also want some guarantees, which fit, fit into number two here, right, which was low, uh, low latency guaranteed communications. But the slicing also has to do with privacy and separability. So if you have this separate slice, it would be, for example, dedicated to uh, firefighting or dedicated to public safety or dedicated to certain applications. Uh, the Office of Personnel Management might, on this uh, third thing, put a slice for sensitive personnel information. And since it isn't on the general internet, since it doesn't have an IP address that everyone can address, it's going to be possible to go and segregate that off. In fact, if you take a look at how our national security works, there's a, something called sensitive compartmentalized information. So the idea to be able to compartmentalize pieces of the internet for certain applications, I think is going to be very important. And some of you may have uh, talked to some of your technical departments on software-defined networking. Software-defined networking is one of the tools that allows for this slicing. So at US Ignite, we really believe, and there's a lot of folks who agree with us, that the next generation of the internet has these three properties. It has the capability for much bigger bandwidth, for keeping the latency really low and to be able to guarantee those low latencies and to be able to have specialized segregated networks that can be created on demand. So if we had a fire emergency right here as we might have now in the, in the Rocky Mountain states, we might need to draw from commercial services more bandwidth than we would at times of the year when there's no fires. So be able to do it very dynamically. I don't mean a 45-day setup. I don't even mean a two-hour setup. I mean more like a two-second setup to be able to go and add things from one slice to a different slice. 
So US Ignite is working on these things. And I wanted to give you a quick preview of some of the things that are going on and will happen. Uh, will happen is that the White House is going to have a White House Community Broadband Summit. They promised it for September. I hope they decided on a date yesterday, and I'm going to find out what that date is when I get back to my email today. Uh, but they're going to be announcing a number of things, including support for US Ignite in following this three-pronged agenda in a certain number of places in the country, some demonstration locations. And I have, in fact, proposed that one of those demonstration locations should be the uh, Salt Lake through Provo area, which could be expanded as we decide to expand it uh, and being able, capable of doing that. So with that, let me just show you some of my slides here. We're after smart gigabit communities. The smart gigabit communities um, is, I think, going to be one of the watchwords we're going to see in government and throughout the industry. We already have from IBM the Smarter Planet. We have smart and connected communities from Cisco. And I think we're going to see some announcements in September um, where the government is going to, across multiple agencies, look at some variation on smart and connected communities. And I want to put the word gigabit in there to mean both of my first two things. The gigabit to me means both the bandwidth and the low latency, and then also the slicing for that. So uh, US Ignite is the umbrella project to do this. We don't own, do not intend to own any infrastructure. Our role, we're a public-private partnership. We work together with a lot of public organizations to create a connected ecosystem of innovative applications and services for economic development, civic resilience, the Internet of Things, smart cities, and our application areas are healthcare, education, public safety, transportation, clean energy, and advanced manufacturing. Let me just break that down briefly for you. In the public-private partnership, we're working with these agencies, the Mozilla Nonprofit Foundation, and this is the team that is busy nationwide trying to make these things happen. There's also a considerable amount of international interest. I'm off to Tokyo tomorrow to go talk to their equivalents of the National Science Foundation and their Office of Science and Technology Policy so that they can also pursue some of these same three objectives. We've already had discussions with Canada, with the European Union, and we think that this is going to occur throughout the um, world. So we're trying to create a connected ecosystem of innovative applications and services. So being able to support FirstNet applications would be one of the things we're trying to do, not by overbuilding, but by being able to uh, lease on demand services that are being already provided and should be provided by existing and maybe new providers in the smart gigabit communities. I told you that uh, we have made a proposal to um, have 12 uh, cities that are named right here be designated hubs for these, this new kind of program. These would be seeds that would be planted that I would hope that if they take root in these 12 locations, will then extend to many others. Yes? How did you select those particular Well, we talked to Kevin Lowe, among other people. Um, uh, she's from Google Fiber, and Google Fiber is one of the US Ignite member organizations, and we have worked closely. So you'll note that we have Austin, Texas, which is also a Google Fiber, Kansas City, uh, which is also a Google Fiber, because Google Fiber has been working quite well and quite closely with us. I've talked to Jeremy Furkin about CenturyLink working with us on these things, uh, and would like, love to talk to many more of you if that will uh, at all help or be able to accelerate things. In addition to the 12 cities, uh, and again, when you see Salt Lake City, I'm not trying to exclude West Valley or uh, Provo. I think that those folks will come on as well. I just needed a, a name to put on the map, so I put on Salt Lake. Um, in addition to these, I believe that there's been enough interest from another set of communities that we will probably add about five to eight more at announcement time in September. So this is unannounced information I'm showing you that's coming from part of the September announcements I referred to. So it's for economic development. We've worked with the economic development folks here in Salt Lake City and Provo, other places for civic resilience so that the city can, in some sense, not be disrupted from cloud computing in case of an earthquake. We know we're in an earthquake zone. If we go and we take out some of the transmission capacity to some of the big data centers elsewhere, 
Twitter stops working. We do not have a Twitter hub here in Salt Lake. We would like to be able to have local civic resilience, local civic communications in case of emergencies. And for the Internet of Things and smart cities, most of these Internet of Things are going to communicate and interact with other local things. Automobiles are going to talk to other local automobiles. Scheduling time through an intersection for automated vehicles is a perfect example of needing low latency, high reliability to be able to make that work. And most of the efforts going on in smart cities, again, are rather local in nature. So we think that's important. And we're trying to do that in healthcare, education, public safety, transportation, clean energy, and advanced manufacturing. Uh, these are all public benefit areas of application, and, the, and we believe that the public benefit is really very important consideration. So that's what the U.S. Ignite effort is. Now here in Utah, we've created a Utah Ignite to be able to go and take these things and make Utah one of those states that not only shows up uh, in a great color on the fraction of people who have high bandwidth, but we think it's the perfect kind of state where we could work with the folks around this table to get to the very low latency, guaranteed uh, connectivity, and to be able to slice things for important uh, segregated applications. For example, healthcare privacy, first net, uh, financial transactions, and so forth. So uh, the major programs going on right now in U.S. Ignite, there's national science funding for innovative applications. There's $10 million per year. If I have time, I'm going to tell you about three of those that are going on in Utah, but this is a national program. We are, with the uh, new announcements in September, going to create a national marketplace of interconnected, interoperable, smart gigabit communities. And again, would like this area to be a demonstration for that. I mentioned Mozilla is one of our partners. They have a program called Mozilla Hives. This is for education-oriented innovation based on advanced telecommunications. So advanced telecommunications technology applied to remote experiential education. The National Institute of Standards and Technology has issued a Global City Team Challenge. We had 1,500 people in Washington June 1st and 2nd, and we had the uh, king and queen of the Netherlands who came showing some of the international interest in these topics uh, and part of our partnership with the European Union. And as I pointed out, please look for the new announcements coming in September. <coughs> Smart Cities Week, the Smart Cities Council is sponsoring events happening the week of September 14th. And uh, maybe we'll have another update after that. Well, yes. Okay. Okay. I'm going to, I will do less than five minutes. The um, community responsibilities that we want to work with, we're looking for communities that will have a civic organizing and steering committee, that will have participation from the major local carriers and ISPs. Obviously, you need to do it because I'm, we're not going to do it. We want to work with you folks to do it. We'd like to see a local interchange point to keep local traffic local and to have smart city servers here in the area that's being served so we don't have to go off to these remote data centers, both for the latency and for the city resilience. So I'll just show you these slides. Uh, these are the kinds of people that we think we're putting together in Utah Ignite to help lead this. And I think that we've got nice civic leadership, academic leadership, corporate leadership from many folks. Um, Devin Baer has been uh, helpful there. And as I said, I've talked to a number of the other folks. Uh, I would mention more names, except that I don't have time. We'd like to see participation by major carriers and ISPs. If your name isn't here, we'd love to have it here. If your name was there, it doesn't mean you committed to anything. It just means I want you. Uh, I think it will benefit everyone in the room if we have a local interchange point for local traffic. Let me emphasize this is not for transit. Mostly to interchange points today are used for transit and there are transit agreements, but I think that everyone can benefit by keeping uh, gigabit end to end within the city. It helps with the resilience, it helps with the ultra low latency, and helps us to be a more self-sufficient, resilient community. Uh, just to give you an example of how that isn't true today, this is my house, Glenn's house. I can see the University of Utah, 
If I had an optical or maybe even just uh, one of your Americom antennas pointed at the university, I could probably get there on extended Wi-Fi or something. It's only like two, mi two and a half miles. But uh, if you read this trace route, you'll find out that my packets went a much longer way. And in fact, a lot of those times you see up there are unacceptable for the Internet of Things. So this is what we've got to fix. And my proposal for fixing this is a local exchange point, and I think it benefits everyone in the room. If you don't have to pay to take stuff out of the city, why should you? And I'm not disrupting any of the services that are otherwise being provided by suggesting that. We also want to see some smart city brain services, some servers located here. Uh, we're initially going to leverage the Genie network, which I'll show you in the next slide. It's for dynamically allocated applications and services would be part of this nationwide marketplace because we would like Utah entrepreneurs to sell their applications and services in all of the cities. Right? We're creating a national marketplace among these initial locations. So applications developed here get to be sold in Kansas City. We want to see all of that happen. I also want to make sure it's replaced by commercial services. This initial genie thing is sponsored by the National Science Foundation. They said we're glad to go and jumpstart this. But eventually, it's going to be people in this room, or maybe people not in this room, I don't know, who will provide those commercial services. This is the Genie map I promised. And you can see that um, Genie has actually been led by Rob Ritchie here at the University of Utah. Um, this is actually a very Utah-centric kind of organization. And you can see that the other cities we have for our initial rollout are largely on this Genie network. So I've run out of time. I'm very interested in talking to any of you. If someone near my spot would grab that deck of cards, divide it in half, and send it around, I'd be glad to talk to any and all of you. I can probably answer, uh, based on what Kelly said, two minutes of questions at most. Thank you very much. I'm just, these, these are the University of Utah and uh, UVU projects that are going on right now with US Ignite funding. This is one I think will be announced in September. We'd like to do uh, remote deep brain stimulation tuning. Right now, if you have a Parkinson or essential tremor, you need it uh, uh, with deep brain stimulation. You have to move to Salt Lake City for a year in order to make that happen. We'd like to enable this throughout the state. So if you have especially gigabit capability in rural areas that we can get back to the University of Utah, we should be able to do this remote brain stimulation tuning, be the first place in the nation to be able to make that happen. So, uh, and then we've got, I've got the things here on other cities uh, that are doing interesting things, but maybe another time I can give you an update on that. Great. Thanks.